Good morning. Welcome to Redemption Community Church. We're glad that you're joining us online from your house church. Make sure you stay connected with us by following us on social media. You can also connect with us this morning by filling out our digital connect card. Just scan this QR code or text RCC Belleville to 97000. This is a great way to get more information about our church or submit prayer requests to our pastoral team. We'd love to connect, so please take some time to do that today. We have multiple ways for you to give your tithes and offerings. If you're meeting in a house church, your host will have an offering box available during your gatherings. You can also always give online at rccbelleville.com give. We ask that you continue to pray for the planting of our next gathering in the downtown Belleville area. Right now, they're in the core team phase of gathering and growing together throughout the week as they prepare for this amazing work. If you would like to learn more about joining the downtown gathering, please email info at rccbelleville.com and we'll get you connected. We'll be posting regular updates on social media in the coming weeks, so be on the lookout for those. We are so glad you're here with us today. We hope you have a great time in worship today as we explore the Gospel of Luke together. Today, our church planting resident, Sean Hall, will be leading us in our teaching time. We hope you have a great day. Hey, church family. I'm Sean Hall. I'm a uh, church planting resident here at RCC. I want to wish you a happy new year, even though that doesn't seem to be working right now. Um, it's been a crazy beginning to this year. And uh, following th this week, your hearts might be very heavy, uh, might be very confused. Maybe you're also angry that this is going on, that this can even happen here in our country. Uh, maybe even at a loss for how a Christ follower should respond to everything happening this week. and even ask the question of how would Jesus react to everything going on? Um, man, if we were to ask our nation that question, and our, even just only Christians from our country, that country of how Jesus would react, we would get just so many different answers from so many different people. And the gap between those answers from you know Jesus being maybe a thousand miles away to Jesus would be breaking windows that's what saddens me today. Um, just, just so sad that there is that much of a gap between what we think Jesus would do. And I, I, I wish for us today to see the true reaction of Jesus. What would his reaction everything right now be? It's a big question, and I'm not going to just give you my opinion. <laughs> You've heard enough opinions this week, I'm not going to give you my opinion or tell you what I think. I want scripture to just guide us today. I want us to continue with our Luke study. And coincidentally, the next verse speaks so much uh, to what we are dealing with right now and how we should respond and how Jesus would respond. But first, I want us to posture ourselves in a way, uh, with a moment of prayer to sort of just leave our citizenship in America and regain our focus as a citizen of heaven and, and knowing Jesus' perspective rather than our perspective uh, or our opinion. So pray with me right now um, before we open up scripture. Jesus, we ask you right now um, to just Help us listen, help us peel away our opinions, peel away our agenda, our thoughts. Lord, help us leave our perspective as a human being or a, you know, just a citizen of America and help us see your perspective. Lord, bring us your mind, bring us your wisdom in this moment, in this cultural moment of, of American history. Uh, where a lot of people are looking at the church, a lot of people are against the church and hating the church right now and blaming the church. Lord, I, I just pray we can step away from that. And Lord, we can just focus our eyes on you, look for answers from you. Um, Lord, just bring us peace right now. We do pray for our nation, though. We pray for peace. We pray for unity 
once again. Lord, we want these things, these things that are good, that protect people, that help people. We want these things in our country. But first, prioritize our life. Prioritize for us the things you, you want to come as first importance, the ways that we can glorify you right now, no matter what. And so, Lord, let your scripture, your word be living and active, double-edged sword that is piercing to our soul and spirit. Lord, where you teach us right now as your church, teach us, Lord, how would you react to everything? Lord, how can we continue to serve you and to serve those around us? And it's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen. So last week, we got back into the Gospel of Luke, back into our Luke series of investigating the words of Jesus. And it, this is so great to be back into because it is is always a good time to see how Jesus lived, see the ways he lived, the principles he lived by, and to, and to catch a glimpse at his character all the time. And so open up to Luke chapter 8. We are back in there, and I'm going to recap a little bit of what Mike talked about last week because it'll tie into today. And, and Mike just gave us an amazing challenge by helping us study the parable of the sower. So open up to Luke chapter 8, verse 11, or actually right before, go to verse 4, and you can see me talk about this as I summarize it. So Jesus is telling a story about a farmer. The farmer is doing his job. He's taking the seed. He's broadcasting it, and it's falling in different places, four different places. And the seed represents the word of God. And so the first place that the seed falls onto is a walking path. So the seed is trampled by others, and it is there's there's a hard, rocky soil probably, and you know what? The birds just come by and they take the seed, and the seed never has a chance to grow roots. And so the birds are, are the devil taking away the word of God before it can actually be planted. It's, it's the worst scenario. The second is the seed is falling onto rocks. So on these rocks, the seed sprouts up very quickly, and it's like a believer who has just this joy in the Lord. But what happens is there's no moisture in the rocks, and so the seed doesn't grow down with roots. And so when a storm comes or when a wind comes by, what happens is the plant just flies away and it dies. It can't handle what life brings. And the third is the seed falls onto thorns. So it falls on this soil where it can actually grow some roots, However, it's next to weeds with thorns on it, and as they grow up, they choke out the word of God. The seed grows, but its health is stolen away, and, and this plant cannot reach maturity, and it never produces fruit. And so Mike gave us an amazing challenge for this year, a new year here. What are these weeds that we can get rid of? We have control. We can take away some of these things that are choking out our life. How can we get rid of maybe the bad habits or, or just unhealthy scenarios that are choking out what God is trying to do for us? And the ultimate goal is this fourth place where it is a rich soil where we can just focus on the Lord, where we can solely be fixed on producing fruit for the kingdom, a soil that is so rich that we can grow these deep roots that no matter what storm comes by, we are confident in the Lord and we are ready to live according to his will. This morning, I, I hope that you are in this place. I hope you are just ready as a follower uh, to withstand any headlines on the news, anything that can come your way. I hope you are just strong in the Lord. And what an incredible challenge that this parable is, that we need to protect our hearts for moments like this. We need to protect our hearts and keep the soil rich and devoid of thorns so that we can receive the seed, which is the word of God. But what exactly is this word of God? 
And so that's what we're going to talk about today. What is, what is, what is Jesus trying to plant in our hearts? What are these things that he wants believers to know and receive? So this is so important, but to find this out, we need to go to verse 10. So same chapter, chapter eight, let's go to verse 10. Verse 10 says this. So he said, Jesus, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you to know, but to the rest, it is in parables so that looking they may not see, hearing they may not understand. So first of all, that sounds pretty cool. The secrets of the kingdom of God, right? That sounds like some inside knowledge, right? And as Mike talked about last week, there are things. uh, The gospel is not going to be received and known by people. And Jesus is saying this, that even though they can see it in clear sight, even though they can hear it, they won't really see what it is. They won't really understand. And that's a tough thing for us to hear sometimes, but then in other times like this where we are tried and tested, man, it's just so such good news that Jesus is giving us something to live by in these moments. So what is it? What is it that people miss in plain sight? What are these things that people don't understand, but for us followers, help us be confident in the Lord and still have peace no matter what's going on? Well, the answer, as Jesus says, are the secrets of the kingdom of God. So I don't know about you. Maybe you like quickly received what that meant. Um, But for me, there is some like national treasure slash Indiana Jones vibes that I need to get through to really know what this means. And so let's break this down a bit. We'll unpack it. Um, First, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's kind of a strange term. We don't talk in kingdoms all the time. But if you can imagine a kingdom, the kingdom has a king. God is king. He has reign. He, he still rules. And so Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God, in contrast to worldly rulers who have power and reigns, the kingdom of God is God having a greater reign, a greater plan, plan and a greater agenda for us. That no matter what's going on, God is leading us for something greater. He is giving us the rules to live a holy life. Not just being... Uh, you know, law-abiding citizens, but he's giving us rules to live a holy life by his standards. And you know what? The only enemy to his kingdom is Satan. This is a good versus evil. It's not a human versus human. This is God is good. He is on his throne. He is in control, and he is helping us live a good life. And the only enemy to that is Satan. And, and is this evil? And we're used to seeing this. We're used to seeing this evil. And that's why we need these secrets to the kingdom of God. Because we need to see how, how do we react to the evil in this world? How do we react? Do we react to the bad things that are going on? How does Jesus react to those? So for followers of Christ, our true allegiance is God's reign as citizens of heaven. Okay, so what are these secrets, though? Why are there secrets, right? So the word is mysterion, right? And and although it sounds like it, it's not a new pharmaceutical drug commercial, okay? Mysterion was actually used a lot in the New Testament. Paul used it a lot. As Paul was traveling into new lands with Gentiles who did not hear the gospel, he talks about the mystery of the gospel, Mystery and secret are the same word. He talks about this mystery of the gospel. Why does he use mystery? Well, here's why. In the Asia Minor region, there were a lot of mystery cults and mystery religions. It was a very popular thing. There are a bunch of them. And so to the Romans, to other people, to Gentiles, Christianity was kind of like just thrown into that category as just another mystery religion. You know what Paul does? Paul kind of says, well, yes and no. So Paul says, yes, it is a mystery. There are ways and plans of the Lord that are a mystery to some. 
that some people won't get it. And Jesus is telling us some people aren't going to understand. But Paul is also saying, well, it's not a mystery because I'm here to share about it. And that mystery, as he explains, is the gospel. The mystery is, why would God send his son to die for us, to be buried and resurrected? Why would he do that? And he, Paul is saying, I am on a mission to share this mystery, to, or to not make it a mystery anymore, to share the good news to you. And so Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples right here, he's pretty much saying, hey, there are mysterious ways of the Lord, that the kingdom of God has many secrets that, you know, God knows. Only God knows his true plans and his, you know, his true purposes to doing different things. Only he can see this. And Jesus needs to tell the disciples this because there are going to be a lot of things that are about to confuse them. <laughs> Mainly why Jesus is being arrested by the, the country they lived in and then being crucified there are so many questions, and, and this is so important for Jesus to tell his disciples that God is going to work in many ways that are mysterious to you. Romans eleven thirty four says this, says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? And Isaiah says it this way, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And these secrets of the kingdom of God are how God plans to do something he always has planned to do. Hear this today, church. God always has plans to glorify himself. No matter what headlines are changing every 30 seconds, we can rest assured today that God is carrying out a plan to glorify himself, even now. Even now. So maybe you're like me and you're kind of, you know, wondering, well, how? How does God plan on glorifying himself? even right now, even with, you know, the things we're seeing and on TV and the ways that Christians are being accused and, you know, and just not fitting into those categories, but being sort of, you know, labeled those things. Like, well, how, what part do I play? Like, how, Lord, are you going to glorify yourself still? Because, you know, it seems like we can be on the losing side sometimes. And so we wonder, Lord, how right now, Will you glorify yourself? Well, we see this in many places in the New Testament. One of the finest places to find this is Jesus' own prayer to our Heavenly Father with the disciples moments before he's being arrested and carried away. So moments before the disciples are very confused, even though they always sort of seem confused, but they will be very confused. Moments before that, Jesus has this prayer where he uses the word glorify so many times because that is God's plan no matter what. But let's see how. Look at um, the book of John, chapter 17, and go to verse 1. Here's what Jesus says. Uh, it says, when, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes up to heaven, even though he was with the disciples and he says this, and he starts this prayer to God. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. There it is. This is how Jesus is going, or God is going to bring glory to himself even now. This is the plan of all along, the glory of God is Jesus. Right now, no matter what, all of the time, the glory of God is Jesus Christ. 
shown through the manifestation of Jesus in our lives and other lives and his plans he's carrying out. Jesus is glorifying God. And you play an incredible part in this. Because as Christ followers, we display that Jesus has done a lot of work on us. That we, we have light to share to show that we are changed people because of what Jesus has done. And at all moments, we are here to be a testimony that God is glorified. That Jesus is real. That Jesus is still working. Because he's working in us. And look what he says, verse 10. He says, all mine are yours. So he's talking about, he says, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Jesus is glorified in us. How is that possible, right? But he uses us that even right now, God can bring glory to himself through us. So, so what are these cop-outs to try and trust in, in politics or material goods or wealth or anything other than Jesus to bring glory to God. What is this about? Why do we run to those things? Why do we give glory to God when a, a celebrity um, says something about God? Why do we give glory to God only if it's popular or if it makes you more blessed? You know, why do we run through these things? Or why do we give glory to God? Because, you know, we have, maybe there's a Christian who's speaking in, in Congress or speaking on TV, like, why do we wait for those moments to know whether God is being glorified? When at all times, he is glorified by showing his son Jesus through us. He is always glorified. This is how we see the glory of God. Through Jesus' work, through you, through me, and through our church, and it is always there. Here's why. There is nothing more impossible right now than making any one of us good enough or deserving enough to stand before a perfect and holy God. There is nothing more impossible on this planet than that happening. Yet, Jesus made that happen. But Jesus made it happen. A gift that none of us deserve never came close to deserving. God loved you so much that he gave up his one and only son to give you unending moments of pure goodness and holiness in a perfect heaven. After this world has faded, this is a moment that you get to have, yet we didn't deserve, yet would be completely impossible without the work of Jesus. What a treasure that we have. To have this much mercy and that this much grace shown knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Now we have this treasure in clay jars, so fragile, right? So that this extraordinary power may be from God and not us. So it's not even about us. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. He continues saying, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. So even though we're jars of clay we're, and we're fragile, we are so strong through Jesus, still able to handle the world. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. God's glory is shown in our hearts and not our nation. God's glory is shown first in our hearts. And these words were written 2,000 years ago. Plans for how God will rule in your heart are far more important the plan, than the plans for how God will, or this country will be ruled according to God's standards. He starts with you. He starts with us. His glory is being made known 
because we show off the work of Jesus in our hearts, our wretched hearts that God changed around. And I'll say it again. It is more impressive for God to clean us up enough for heaven than it is for him to rule a nation. Here's why. God's already ruled a nation before, and he didn't have to send his one and only son down to make it possible, to, to die for that nation. No. He could rule this nation if he wanted to, okay? But Jesus sacrificed his life to save us and show ultimate glory to God through that. That no matter whether you are Republican or Democrat, you're from this country or another country, no matter what Jesus can and will show his glory through you. So let's not play the labels. Let's not write more boundary lines. We don't need that. We just need to be confident right now in the work Jesus has done in us and be a part of his work with our neighbors, with things that are closer to us. So maybe right now we need to get off of Facebook. We need to get off of the news. We need to walk outside. We need to be present with those around us. We need to just keep doing what we do as Christ followers. And it's just following his lead to love others. So you want to make a difference right now. So you want God's glory to be shown. Or maybe you want the reputation of Christ to be restored again in our nation. I get it. But let it be restored in our heart first. Let Jesus get to work. Right? Let us humble ourselves, boast in our weakness so that God's perfect grace can bring us to perfection. Let Jesus show off the work he's done in us. Let's seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and he will provide all we need. He'll provide peace for us through these moments and comfort us in this moment. Let your soil be rich so that we can grow deeper roots down in the Lord. Delight yourself in the, the commands of Christ because they are not burdensome and live unashamed of the gospel. Plant yourselves by streams of righteousness so we can continue this year to have a rich soil to be ready for where the Spirit leads us, to be ready to help others, to be ready to be convicted in our own hearts too. To just be open-handed in following Jesus. Let's keep it simple. Let's, let's keep glorifying God. So here's the next step for us. As a house church or maybe as a family, this prayer in John 17 is so powerful. And I I want you all to meditate on this prayer together. Read it. Take out the Bible. Read this together. And maybe read it again. There is just so much here for how, how God plans to glorify himself even when things don't seem to be going the right way. He has this mysterious plan that is so good and is working to glorify himself. So do that. Read John 17. It's house, church, or family. And then... and talking about this question. How is God glorifying himself today? Maybe that's through you, um, but really try and think of that. You know, how does God plan to glorify himself? Right now, 2021, don't be afraid to open the word back up and whatever you come up with, seek after those good things 